Hi, everyone. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which I meet and today, and that is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and to any other Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders people here today. The Informal Urbanism Research Hub welcomes you to the Informal Formal Urbanism, the Challenges of Co-Production webinar series. My name is Crystal Legacy, and I'm a Senior Lecturer in Urban Planning at the University of Melbourne. I'm also the Deputy Director of the Informal Urbanism Research Hub, and I joined Professor Kim Devi, Director of INFER, in welcoming you to the event today. I'm delighted to be welcoming Associate Professor Kurt Ibsen from the University of Sydney today. His scholarship will be well known to many of you in attendance. Kurt is a passionate writer on questions of social justice and how this can be achieved in cities. Focusing on these questions, Kurt's research explores the significance of the urban public realm for citizenship and for democracy. His work examines how urban planning might work better to achieve social justice in cities, and he has published several important books on this issue, including most recently, Everyday Equalities, Making Multicultures in Settler Colonial Cities, published last year. Chris, Kurt's research um, is focused on the governance of the outdoor media landscape, uh, from graffiti to government notices, shop signages, outdoor advertising, as well as the spatial politics of urban informatics, uh, with a particular focus on their implications for privacy and urban citizenship. His address today is titled Elite Informality in Action, the Governance of Graffiti in Sydney. Kurt will speak for about 40 minutes, um, and then we'll open the floor to your questions. Um, so please um, do enter your questions in the chat function at the bottom of the screen. So without further ado, Kurt, I'd like to pass it on over to you. Thank you again for joining us today. Oh, well, thank you very much for inviting me, Crystal. Uh, and let me extend that thanks to um, Kim and Tanzil as well. It's a real uh, honor to be asked to uh, be part of this series. And um, let me also start by acknowledging that um, I too am here on stolen Aboriginal land, quite a distance from you. I'm up on uh, Darkenjung country which is a couple of hours north of Sydney uh, on what is now known as the New South Wales Central Coast. So I want to pay my respects to the Duck and Jung people, um, elders past, present and emerging, and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues joining us on the Zooms today. Um, and I know, look, it's not quite what we'd all imagine for this symposium, is it, being stuck on the Zooms? Um, I wish we could all be together in Melbourne, but such is life right now. And I especially hope that everybody in Melbourne is doing okay several weeks into your second lockdown. It must be really tough. So hang in there, folks. <laughs> and hopefully this will provide some light relief or something for us all. So um, just gonna uh, share my screen here now um, and hopefully this will all work. I've promised a talk that's a case study of elite urban informality in action through um, uh, some research I've done about the governance of graffiti and street art in Sydney uh, over the last few years, which is the city where I live and work and organise. Um, and as um, those who know me might know, I often find myself thinking about urbanisation and the urban through graffiti, um, in part because it was working with graffiti writers in youth centres uh, many moons ago that got me interested in doing more research about public space in the first place, um, in part because I occasionally dabble in some graffiti and street art myself, uh, and in part also because it seems that what happens in this space always seems so revealing of a whole set of broader urban dynamics in policing and planning and politics in public space. So I want to start my talk today with a little vignette from some research that I conducted into the regulation uh, of graffiti a few years ago in Sydney. Work that I did with a team that included my colleague Cameron McCaller from Western Sydney University, street artist Wendy Murray and graffiti writer Matthew Pete. So a few years ago, um, a property owner in the inner Sydney suburb of Chippendale commissioned graffiti artists Peck and Teaser to produce this large piece that you can see um, on the wall of her house, which sat at the end of a row of terrace houses. Now the wall was frequently tagged uh, and she decided that a mural would be nicer. Now, not long after Peck uh, and Teaser put this piece up, a couple of city rangers employed by the local government noticed the new piece of graffiti on one of their regular patrols. Now, part of the city ranger's job is to keep a lookout for things like illegal graffiti, um, and local councils in New South Wales actually have the legal authority to remove graffiti from private property. Um, and like 
many others, this particular council employs a private uh, company to perform regular patrols and remove illegal graffiti. Uh, so while this was clearly a work that was quite distinct from the tags that they'd usually noticed on the wall and had removed in the past, uh, they decided to check on the legality of this piece that they noticed. Um, and um, given its location in the city, the legality of this piece was not only defined by whether or not the artist had the permission of the property owner, it was also defined by whether or not the property owner had the permission of the council to modify her property with an artwork of this size in this particular location in the city through a formal development consent. So the rangers made some inquiries and on checking council databases, it turned out that this piece didn't have council approval. Now, as I say, at this point, given the council's legal powers, uh, they could have arranged for the graffiti removal, removal contractors to remove or buff the piece without the owner's consent because local governments in New South Wales actually have now the legal right to uh, remove graffiti from private property without owner's consent. But they didn't do that in this case. After all, they thought it was a pretty nice piece of graffiti. So instead, at this point, the rangers decided to give the property owner a heads up that the piece didn't have planning approval and might be removed if such approval wasn't arranged. So what happened next? Well, the property owner, um, had previously established a good relationship with the manager of her local neighborhood service center. So she approached the manager who agreed on seeing some pictures that the piece was indeed pretty high quality and worth keeping. So the manager then walked the owner through the development application process to secure planning approval for the work, including facilitating a site visit by one of the planning assessment team. Now, later when we interviewed her, the neighborhood service centre manager reflected that, and I quote, it's a beautiful mural and it's got to stay and it's registered now, it's DA approved. But she did all that after the fact and we shouldn't have punished her like that really, you know, threatening to remove it just because it wasn't approved. Now, this story came to my attention while I was uh, doing the research that I mentioned that was actually funded by the local government in question. And when we later put this story to one of the council's planners as a potential model for a more flexible process of securing a kind of retrospective uh, approval that might formalize an informal permission arrangement that uh, was pretty common across the city, this planner told us that this model that had happened in this instance simply could not work as a kind of policy setting. Development applications, he told us, simply cannot be retrospective. Now, we pointed out that in this case, approval had indeed been retrospective, to which he replied in the only way he could reply in a formal interview by asserting that this simply was not possible. Now, this story isn't especially remarkable on a whole bunch of levels, especially to anyone who's familiar with the everyday practices and contradictions of urban planning. But I wanted to start my talk with this story today because it speaks to my main theme, the embrace of informality by state authorities and elite actors seeking to get things done in a city like Sydney. Now, the ultimate formal recognition of this particular piece was the product of property owners and state agents acting well outside of the formal planning system to produce and then preserve a piece of graffiti that they considered to be a form of neighborhood improvement. It started when the property owner gave her permission to the artists, an informal permission that she had no right to give at law. It continued in the action of the council rangers who applied their own aesthetic judgment in not immediately having the piece removed despite their legal obligation and right to do so. The plot then thickened even further with the subsequent involvement of the neighborhood service manager and planners who turned a blind eye, a blind eye I should say, to the pre-existence of the piece uh, and shepherded its way through a costly development application process that in this case was retrospective even though that's formally impossible. And finally, of course, we were told that everything that had happened could not possibly happen by a planner who was responsible for developing and enforcing planning codes in the city. So um, in the rest of what I've got to say today, I'm hoping to uh, expand on this discussion and make a contribution, hopefully, to the growing literature on informality from above or elite informality, uh, as well as the emerging literature on informal urbanism in Australian cities, um, and hopefully say a little about the governance of graffiti too by reflecting on this episode and several other examples of elite informality or informality from above that we discerned in the research that we did a few years ago. 
Now, uh, graffiti's an especially good case, I think, for thinking about elite informality, precisely because the idea that graffiti would be governed through informality cuts against the story about graffiti that is usually told by urban authorities. The story that their war on graffiti is a war waged on behalf of law and order against the disorder and the illegality of graffiti and its informal appropriations and illegal appropriations of public space. But as we'll see, um, this goal of authorities to either eradicate graffiti or to put certain valued forms of graffiti in their proper place is actually enacted through practices that themselves frequently sit outside the law and outside of formal planning processes. I think seeing it this way helps us to see the conflict over the place of graffiti, not as a conflict between formal regulations and informal appropriations, but rather as a conflict over the inscription of different values and different aesthetic values, particularly in the governance of urban public space, uh, in which authorities themselves also embrace informality as a mode of production in the city. So my talk is gonna proceed in four steps from here. Firstly, I just want to uh, say a little about informal uh, informality and elite informality uh, in terms of the current literature on that topic. Secondly, I want to give a tiny bit more context about graffiti governance before then getting into a few more examples of elite informality in action. Uh, and then finally, try and do some analysis of what I think we've found in the research that we've done uh, on this topic. So um, let me then say uh, in the first part a little bit about elite informality. So um, look, in recent years, um, as we know, a vibrant literature on urban informality has emerged in urban studies internationally. Um, now in the urban context, you know, informally, informality has typically been used to denote activities in cities that don't conform to existing legal and land use regulations. So um, it's important to distinguish uh, but the informal from the criminal conceptually, even though they may overlap in practice. Uh, so while informal practices might be illegal, such illegality is not simply a matter of breaking criminal codes, uh, rather it's the, usually the legal codes of labour or commerce or planning and the like that are breached. So uh, for instance, while it's not illegal to sell burgers or kebabs on the street, uh, sorry, while it's not illegal to sell them, full stop, uh, some burgers or kebabs that are sold informally by street vendors uh, who are not licensed to run a restaurant in the space they've rented or to sell food from a truck uh, might be considered as informal part of an informal economy. Uh, while it's not illegal to provide childcare, some childcare might be provided through informal cash in hand arrangements between parents and carers and so on and so forth. Now, um, I guess it probably will be familiar to many people who are interested in being part of this symposium that the discussions of informality have increasingly sought to push past any notion that it is restricted to the so-called informal sector which was typically equated with the urban poor in cities of the global south. Instead, there's been an emphasis, an emphasis, I should say, on thinking about informality as a mode of urbanization, a way of getting things done that has diverse geographies, actors, and politics. So the concept has increasingly found its way into the analysis of urbanization beyond the global south, where there's been a renewed interest in how everyday informal practices um, that aren't compliant with regulatory frameworks uh, are also prevalent in the apparently ordered and formalized and affluent cities of the global north. And also how uh, that informality has an interesting micro geography too, not just in peripheries, but also in urban centers, etc. Um, and uh, I guess myself and a few colleagues have tried to make a bit of a contribution to that literature in a recent paper we published about urban informality in Australian cities, surveying a range of different informalities. Um, and another of the key directions in the uh, recent literature on informality is to insist that it's uh, best thought of as a set of practices rather than a particular actor or place. Uh, and of course, actors and places are important here, uh, but the point is that a practice-based practice -based approach sees informality, as I say, as a way of getting things done that can be mobilized by a wide variety of actors in a wide variety of settings for a wide variety of purposes with a wide variety of politics. Um, and importantly then, informality isn't just a practice of marginalized urban inhabitants getting by, but also uh, something that uh, elite or uh, state actors can use in getting things done. As friend Tonkas puts it, uh, informality uh, and recourse to informality is also a routine tactic of the powerful. 
Now, an Andrew Roy's studies of informality were especially influential in drawing attention to the existence of what she called informality from above. Uh, as she noted in her 2009 paper, informality, and I'm quoting, exists at the very heart of the state and is an integral part of the territorial practices of state power. Now, more recently, summarizing the literature on elite informality, uh, Faiza Moatsasim, who uh, I note is actually giving a presentation as part of this symposium next week, which I'm really looking forward to hearing. She's recently observed in a great paper in urban studies that the elite informality literature to date has tended to focus especially on the ways that developers have been supported by state actors in the informal production and subsequent legitimization of high-end spaces for elite consumers, uh, like high-end housing estates or shopping malls that dispossess the urban poor. But she urges us to explore other variants and actors involved in elite informality or informality from above uh, and other contexts in which that kind of informality might be taking place. Uh, and that sort of inspired me to go back to some of this research I've done in Sydney and to think about uh, how it might be practiced here as well. So in some ways, the paper today is you know, taking her up on that invitation, trying to tell some stories about informality from above in Sydney in the governance of graffiti that don't involve developers in land grabs, uh, but mostly involve state actors at different scales uh, from the state to local government. And they're not so much appropriating space as uh, I'm gonna argue, uh, creating a very particular aesthetic order that's part of a broader urban project of placemaking. So um, before I get into those examples, I'm gonna spend just a couple of minutes setting a bit of context for those of you who aren't super familiar with graffiti and street art in cities. Uh, because I think it's sort of necessary for me for you to make sense of the examples that follow. So um, if graffiti has always been with us in cities, um, in the late 1960s and 1970s, we did see the emergence of new styles of graffiti in cities like Philadelphia and New York City that were coalescing around the kind of nascent hip hop culture there, practiced especially but not exclusively by African American, Latino and Latina youth. Now, um, the classic story, as it's told, is that uh, in those cities, uh, urban authorities waged their war against graffiti, which came to be represented as a paradigmatic so-called quality of life offense that became the target or even the instigator of uh, what is now referred to as zero tolerance policing. The use of heavy criminalization and fortification in our urban environment to try and eradicate graffiti and punish the people who were perpetrating it. Uh, but of course, that war on graffiti, um, like the war on drugs and many other wars, uh, didn't stop the practice. Uh, and it certainly didn't stop it from uh, circulating to many cities around the world, including cities here in Australia. Uh, and I've written a much longer history of that uh, migration of graffiti culture from uh, New York to Sydney in, a, in my Publics in the City book many years ago for people who are interested in that story. But for today's purpose, uh, I guess the key point that I just want to make is that as we've seen the emergence and mutation and proliferation of graffiti styles in our urban environment, that has elicited a range of policy responses that have also mutated and proliferated. We continue to have in many cities um, a kind of zero tolerance policy framework where graffiti is criminalized, uh, where penalties are increasingly harsh for things like the possession of spray cans with intent, which I kid you not is a crime here in New South Wales. Uh, criminal, uh, fines and uh, even custodial sentences for people who are caught being repeat offenders and also lots of money invested in the rapid removal of graffiti and in graffiti proofing our urban environment. Alongside that uh, we've also seen a growing uh, policy agenda that we might refer to as harm minimization uh, which seeks to engage and then divert graffiti practitioners and to make proper places in the city for graffiti where young people who are into graffiti culture can do their thing without having to break the law. For example, through the provision of so-called legal walls for um, graffiti or through the provision of uh, you know, programs in youth centers that teach young people how to do really good graffiti and how to do it legally. Uh, and as I mentioned before, I've worked in one of those programs many years ago. Uh, and finally, we've also had uh, increasing, uh, I guess, valuing of certain forms of graffiti in street art in place making and place marketing agendas in cities uh, that embrace especially uh, so called street art forms of graffiti, uh, the more colourful, you know, you might say well executed uh, forms of graffiti as something that can actually add value to uh, from sort of communal and from commercial perspectives. Uh, and that has resulted in, for instance, festivals and programs to actually commission works 
of street art in significant public spaces by significant artists and also certain degrees of tolerance for particular styles of work in public that are typically contrasted with the tags uh, and the throw-ups that uh, I guess you can see in um, that picture on this slide. So in a city like Sydney, all this has led to a bunch of laws and planning codes. Uh, if you were to try uh, and do graffiti in this city, uh, you'd have to first of all confront the Graffiti Act, uh, which outlaws unauthorized inscriptions uh, using a variety of implements, which outlaws the possession of some of those implements, uh, especially for minors, uh, and which gives local governments powers to paint over graffiti on private property where they find it without the consent of the owners. Um, also, there is uh, a whole bunch of local government zoning ordinances that also impact on the uh, possibilities for graffiti and street art in public spaces. Uh, they regulate what can actually be authorised uh, in the sense that they place notional restrictions on what owners can do to the appearance of their property, should they actually want graffiti or street art on their walls. Uh, and in Sydney, um, that's complicated by the fact that we have over a dozen local government authorities with their own local environment plans uh, that have different forms of codes and regulations about the appearance of the public realm. Um, and now, as I said in my introduction, um, the story that's usually told about this kind of governance of graffiti is a story about attempts to use the law and planning to eradicate or regulate the informal practice and the informal appropriation of public space by graffiti writers. And, you know, I've contributed to uh, some of that research by writing articles about zero tolerance and other forms of regulation of graffiti. But uh, thinking more about informality as I have been recently, I'm starting to see this whole issue of graffiti governance from another angle and to see the ways in which actually it's not just the construction of laws uh, and the formal uh, interventions in the environment by property owners and states that are regulating and governing graffiti, but a whole bunch of very informal practices that exist outside of those uh, property and planning frameworks that are particularly important. So let me then um, take you through a few examples of uh, informality from above or elite informality uh, alongside the one that I told at the start of my talk. Um, that as I say, are all drawing on that research project that I did with other colleagues. So uh, the first is um, uh, an example where we found uh, the New South Wales state government here, uh, that's the state in which Sydney is based, for those of you who are not from Australia and might not know, uh, back in the year 2000 actually buffing or removing graffiti from private property without having any legal right or entitlement to do so. Now this all happened around the year 2000 when Sydney uh, hosted the Olympics um, and there was a massive crackdown by both the state government and also by the local government in charge of the inner urban area, the city of Sydney, on graffiti uh, in what uh, graffiti writer Spice at the time referred to as a brownout of the entire city. So we just had teams of people going around trying to find all forms of graffiti that they could uh, and you know covering them up with brown paint uh, so as to make the city look attractive or so they thought for visitors and for the television screens uh, during the Olympics. Now the Lord Mayor of Sydney at the time, Frank Sartor, later admitted that the city of Sydney not only removed graffiti from its own assets and property during this period, it also illegally removed graffiti from private property without first seeking the owner's permission. In other words, you know, he admitted several years later that he had sent teams around with the explicit instructions that you are to paint people's private property without asking them first whether that was okay with them. Now that practice uh, was seen to be such a success that it was subsequently formalized and made legal by the state government with the introduction of new legislation in 2002, which gave local governments the legal right to remove graffiti, as I say, from private property without the owner's permission, if it was visible from a public place. Um, and Reflecting on this, a couple of years later, Frank Sartor said that he was particularly proud of that graffiti legislation uh, and the uh, powers that were given to local governments in its wake. Now, what's important also about this story is that it kicked off a kind of graffiti removal industry uh, where a bunch of private contractors increasingly began selling their services to local governments across New South Wales to do regular patrols uh, through their streets and to remove graffiti from private property and from public property on behalf of those authorities. So those contractors become important agents in my next two examples of informality from above. Um, now, uh, the next, I guess, set of uh, examples that um, 
I want to go through are examples of buffing graffiti that actually did have uh, legal permission to be there and wasn't in breach of any planning codes, but doing so simply because the people who were doing the graffiti removal in the city didn't think it looked any good. Uh, so let me take you through a couple of examples of that. Uh, in our research, we uncovered several stories of city contractors removing graffiti and street artworks that had the explicit approval of the property owner without the owner's knowledge or approval. Um, unlike the Chippendale case with which I opened my talk today, here council rangers uh, basically made judgments that pieces weren't worth saving even if they had permission and legal status uh, and just removed them uh, without making any inquiries about them in the first place. Um, so for instance, at one residential property in the inner suburb of Glebe, a property owner had made contact with two local Aboriginal young people through the local youth service and commissioned them to paint a piece on the lane facing wall of her rear studio. The young people she contacted weren't high profile or famous artists, they were just locals, uh, but the owner paid for the paint that they used and paid for their time. She was really happy with their work when it was finished, but shortly afterwards, she returned home one day from work to find that the wall had been painted over by the city's graffiti removal contractors and a letter left for her explaining that the painting on her wall didn't have uh, approval, so it should not have been removed. Uh, now, we flushed out this story uh, many years afterwards. She'd never complained to the council that actually it did have approval. Uh, she wasn't aware of the fact that actually it also didn't require any planning approvals because it happened in the rear laneway rather than on the front facing uh, facade of her house. So um, there it is, you know, one example of uh, a legally uh, permissible form of graffiti that was uh, illegally, as it were, or informally removed by uh, contractors because they didn't like the look of it. Uh, we found um, other cases of this too in our travels. Uh, one of them that I think, um, oh, hang on was particularly poignant. I just wanted to flick this uh, picture up here um, where uh, you can see this wall here that had been set aside by a property owner for use by local young people as well. Again, uh, facing a laneway this time, so not requiring planning consent, uh, where the council contractors had come and uh, removed a whole bunch of artwork. And the uh, property owner had left a little note to the artist saying, it wasn't my idea to cover it up. Uh, they did it without my approval, which really speaks to uh, some of the complex legalities and formalities that are going on here. Uh, so um, let me get back to my list. Um, the third kind of uh, informality from above that we found in our research um, is further instances like, um, I guess the story I started the paper with today of contractors leaving things that are illegal because they do look good uh, or they might be important. So um, in contrast to the two that I've just talked about, uh, where you know, things were removed that had permission, uh, we found several cases where graffiti removal teams consulted with council officers before removing graffiti that they thought might be uh, illegal and uncommissioned because they thought it looked good and were worried about um, covering it up. Now, typically the way that this worked is that uh, as the teams are out on the street, they'll come across something, see it, have a chat, think, oh, maybe we shouldn't cover this up and then get in touch with either the contract manager for the city or with the public art manager. Now, no formal structures or frameworks were in place to guide their exercise of judgment or indeed to guide the judgment that was applied by the contract manager or by the public art manager. Rather, decisions about the fate of such pieces were made in part in relation to the content of the pieces uh, and in part in relation to the quality of the piece itself and in part about where it was found. Um, now, there was kind of, um, an implicit appreciation, in other words, here uh, among both the removal teams and key decision makers in the city, that some instances of street art and graffiti, even if they were illegal, might be deemed acceptable uh, or even desirable um, in the local neighborhood or community uh, and that it uh, therefore should be left alone. Now, um, this practice is driven in part, I should say, uh, by fear of embarrassment um, infamously, one day in 2010, graffiti removal contractors in Melbourne erased a stencil, a stencil by, uh, you know, world famous rat bag Banksy. Uh, and that made the news around the world that he was um, a council in a city known uh, as a mecca for street art who had uh, cleaned up a wall that had a piece by a very famous artist that was probably worth tens of thousands of dollars. And they'd done so accidentally. 
So um, Sydney were especially keen to not repeat that mistake as well. Um, and so, you know, there was a sort of tacit, tacit instruction uh, to the removal contractors to uh, check in before removing things that might, uh, you know, be good um, or might uh, be by famous artists and thereby uh, avoid kind of embarrassment for the council. Now, the same approach of sort of tacit endorsement of some um, illegal graffiti and street art was also taken by planners as well as graffiti removal contractors. Now, um, in preparing this paper, I went back over uh, an interview that I did with a planner uh, where I uh, sought to understand the existing uh, regulatory framework for a resident who might want to formalize an informal arrangement with a graffiti writer or mural artist for a kind of permission wall, like uh, our story from Chippendale at the very start. Uh, and you know, what would it take to, I guess, you know, grease the wheels for that sort of thing and even uh, change the planning framework to make it less burdensome to do so. Uh, now, looking back on that transcripts, it seems that uh, me and the planner spent most of our time talking at cross purposes, but things got really interesting when we tried to think through some concrete examples. Uh, and in this part of the interview, the planner actually then, you know, took me over to their computer, opened up a file full of photos they had from their personal, you know, iPhoto uh, program, uh, and showed me a, a piece of street art that they really liked. Uh, and they'd taken a picture in their walk around the city because they'd seen it and loved it. Um, and then it'd come back to the office to check whether it was actually, you know, approved and realized that it wasn't. So I was told that while technically this piece didn't have a planning consent and could thus be removed, that the council in this instance had probably not acted because there had been no complaints from neighbors or residents. Now I noted that this was interesting, but surely it left that kind of work vulnerable to single complaints uh, and wondered what the process might be for someone to get planning approval so that they could invest in that kind of work on their property without fear of being removed. And the planner's answer in the interview was, and I quote, well, if you ask the questions, we'll give you the answer, but really you shouldn't be asking. And that's because in this case, the answer that the planner would have to give was that if you wanted to put a piece on your wall in that particular part of the city, you would need to do a formal development application that would cost several thousand dollars and it would still result in a potentially negative outcome if there were any objections from the neighbors. Uh, so as a senior planner, he was letting me know that many people just go ahead and do that kind of work and that he and his planning team were unlikely to intervene proactively uh, unless their intervention was triggered by objections from neighbors. Um, and so um, in other words, it's kind of a tacit acknowledgement that these things will survive, that council might not even go out uh, and actively seek to remove them uh, because they look good and nobody's complained. So let's just uh, let it sit. Now, uh, my final example um, is, uh, I guess, a kind of toleration, not only of certain you know, high quality pieces in situ across the city, but also a toleration of illegal graffiti in certain uh, parts of the city, particularly in leftover spaces. Now, um, the graffiti removal that I've been describing is labor intensive, it's expensive, and as a consequence, while local governments have the authority to remove illegal graffiti from all uh, property across the city that is you know, visible from a public space, they do tend to focus and concentrate their efforts on hotspots and strategic corridors. Um, so some places are basically left alone, and they tend to be the leftover spaces in the city that aren't highly visible to the public, uh, and places where, in the end, graffiti writers and street artists know that they can do work without the fear of rapid removal uh, and intervention. And while it might appear odd to suggest that the existence of such spaces is the product of a form of regulation, in fact, that we would argue that urban authorities are often very complicit in the existence of these kind of leftover spaces and those arrangements that leave graffiti in place in those spots. That is, while graffiti and street art um, in such locations might not be legal or positively endorsed, they're definitely tacitly tolerated. Uh, and this informal toleration, while it's the product of a very pragmatic and largely unspoken approach to the regulation of urban space, is actually really significant in shaping the ongoing production of public space and the geography of graffiti and street art in the city. It sort of funnels work into those spaces because if you're an artist and you're about to invest, uh, you know, 12 hours of your time and hundreds of dollars worth of paint in uh, doing a piece, you're more likely to do that in a spot that you think is going to be left alone than in a spot that you think might risk being uh, covered up within 24 hours by a graffiti contractor. Um, so let's um, talk then about what's going on in these examples of informality from above that I've just uh, given you. Um, 
And you can see, by the way, um, that I'm toggling between informality from above and elite informality because uh, I'm not sure what's the best to use. And I'm pretty sure that I need to work through the terminology of this. I'm actually a bit uncomfortable in some ways about using elite informality as a term to describe uh, what I've been finding here. I know I put that in the title of the talk, but the more I think about it, the more I think um, some of the actors that are involved here, particularly the graffiti contractors themselves, couldn't really be considered as elites in the sense that they're actually often quite low paid casual contractors. Um, but certainly maybe that idea of informality from above or even state informality better captures what's going on here, but we can get into that in the discussion. But hopefully you're getting the picture that graffiti is not only produced through informal practice, but it's also governed by a set of informal practices that take place outside of the formal and legal uh, regulatory frameworks for the management of graffiti. So the first point that I want to make about this, I think is a pretty simple one. Um, and that is, we see across these uh, little examples, a range of intentions from repression and erasure uh, in the first two cases of the mayor enacting powers he didn't have to the buffing of formally approved permission walls through to the facilitation and even the preservation of graffiti and street art in other instances like our uh, contractors leaving things in place or our planners uh, you know, tolerating the uh, pieces that get no complaints or tolerating the spaces that are out of the way. Um, and the second point that I then want to make is that all this informality is in some ways actually facilitated by the very complexity of the formal laws and regulations that uh, determine the legality or illegality of any given piece of graffiti um, in the city. So for a writer, uh, a graffiti writer that is, or a property owner or a removal contractor or even a planner, the question of whether any given wall in the city is, uh, you know, free for a piece of graffiti, uh, that is, um, you know, it's possible to do something that might actually have formal status uh, and legal recognition is an incredibly context, uh, complex question that is, you know, answered with reference to a whole bunch of regulations, not just the Graffiti Crimes Act, but also heritage regulations, regulations about signage, public visibility, and so much more. Uh, and it seems to me, uh, reflecting on this, that powerful actors can sort of assert their preferences and do what they want, use their discretion outside of the formal frameworks and get away with it, precisely because um, who's going to correct them? Who actually knows what the uh, right thing to do or what the formal uh, regulations would dictate here? And this is really not unlike what Ryan Devlin has found in his awesome uh, research into the regulation of street traders in New York City. And I know that Ryan is also giving a paper that I really look forward to in this uh, series at the same time as Pfizer, actually, uh, I think next week. Uh, but um, he found in his uh, research into the, uh, you know, the management of street trading in New York City that, um, you know, oftentimes police or property owners would simply tell traders to move on, uh, depending on a range of other factors that had much more to do with complaints and neighborhood dynamics than the actual law itself. Uh, as he put it, acts of intimidation and harassment are facilitated by the complex and opaque nature of vending laws. And they work to structure space in a largely informal manner with informality itself serving as a mechanism of spatial management and control. So the third point then that I wanna make um, is that all of this uh, is going on. And I think even though there's sort of diverse practices going on here and uncertainty, I think we can discern a commonality of purpose across the different examples of informality from above that I've found in this research. And that commonality of purpose is the production and reproduction of a very particular aesthetic order in the public spaces of my city. Now we're now at a point where very specific forms of street art are considered to add character to the street, precinct or neighborhood in which they're found. These works are typically the colorful and image heavy uh, street art, so-called street art works which avoid the appearance of graffiti through avoiding both the privileging of the letter form and the tag name of the artist and also have a kind of cohesive, coherent appearance in the street. Uh, they also avoid any contentious content that might generate objections uh, that then trigger the kind of complaints that local governments would have to deal with. Uh, so just to give you a couple of examples, uh, you know, juxtapositions of what I'm talking about. On the left, we have the kinds of graffiti and street art that tend to not be viewed favorably. On the right, an example of the kind that are. And hopefully just aesthetically, you can sort of note some of the differences here stylistically uh, in terms of the presentation of the work, in terms of the uh, coherence of it in the space, the framing of it, et cetera. Uh, again, 
um, here uh, two things that are, and I could have gone on and found you three million examples of this from my research, uh, where we see these two things again in very close proximity to one another in the city. One that's the subject of uh, regular removal, the other that's been in place for many years. So place making and place marketing is what's going on here. Uh, the use of certain forms of street art and graffiti to enhance the reputation uh, and indeed the property values of some neighbourhoods by adding character and vibe and creativity and all that uh, good stuff that the so-called creative city uh, is meant to endorse and embrace. So allowing and encouraging these kinds of works while discouraging those that are considered to reduce quality of life and character is actually what's going on here. But that is a very difficult thing to incorporate into formal planning policy and criminal law. Uh, but that doesn't make such distinctions impossible to actually enforce in practice. So to the solution to the fact that it's very hard to incorporate the distinctions between these forms in law is precisely to embrace the kinds of informal governance practices that I've just described. Now, this is actually very similar, I think, to what Asher Gertner found in his study of urbanization in Delhi. Uh, and his 2015 book, Rule by Aesthetics, uh, tells the story of all manner of instances of planning outside of formal planning frameworks, such that malls and luxury housing developments uh, could be constructed in Delhi in violation of planning law, while slums and poor housing that had actually managed to acquire legal recognition were demolished illegally by governments despite that recognition. Now, Gertner's interpretation of what he found is also applicable in my cases, I think. He found another logic guiding the action of authorities and elites in Delhi, which was less about imposing the order and legality inscribed in formal planning codes and property law, and more about realizing an aesthetic order that in that case was an order of uh, world-class Delhi. Now, as he put it, intensely political decisions about who and what belongs in the city took place primarily on the basis of codes of appearance, not documents and records. So planning here was not a matter of the rigorous application of formal planning rules, but of producing a particular aesthetic order that he terms plannedness, an attribute of urban space that was key to the determination of legality, uh, and which was defined as that which looks planned, regardless of its formal standing in actual planning law. So standards of order and appearance are what directed action here as much as any formal planning codes or planning laws. And that's certainly the case, I think, in the instances of informality from above that I've described. Um, the aesthetic order that directs action here has shifted over time. Uh, we're now in the city embracing certain forms of <laughs> graffiti aesthetics and street art aesthetics. And it's that embrace of those forms that are perceived to add character to an environment that is actually guiding action that sometimes happens through uh, formal planning mechanisms, but sometimes, as I've demonstrated, happens outside them. Uh, and what's particularly interesting about uh, Gertner's work on Delhi is that that aesthetic order that he talks about in a book that is called Rule by Aesthetics um, is not just uh, you know, imposed from above, but is actually also becomes a kind of common sense in the city that's embraced from below. And I think actually uh, in a story that I don't have time to tell today, we can see the way that actually many graffiti writers and street artists themselves have started to embrace this idea uh, that certain kinds of work that they can do uh, shouldn't be considered as graffiti, but should be considered as street art precisely because they can add to character uh, as a way of trying to, you know, make space for themselves in the city. Um, but it's been really interesting also watching uh, some instances where we can see how um, uh, graffiti artists and uh, street artists have actually uh, kind of, you know, hat and uh, you know, played around with this uh, informal regulation of graffiti uh, and street art that I've been discussing. Um, I know I'm running out of time, so two very brief examples. Um, but here we can see uh, a couple of works by Barry McGee, who's a US-based, very famous street artist that was actually funded by the City of Sydney to come and uh, do some work as part of the Laneway Festival in Sydney. Uh, and proceeded to make a point about uh, the kind of way that some forms of graffiti were looked down upon while others were being embraced by uh, using the funding and the opportunity that he'd been given to do a massive graffiti style throw up and a wall full of tags. Um, that is not exactly what the city thought that they were paying for, but what they got to try and make a point about um, the fact that, you know, uh, these forms were very important in the subculture that he came from and that was being uh, embraced on some levels by the city, but, uh, you know, 
governed in very particular ways. Um, and another example that uh, I also find um, extremely fun um, is one uh, that happened in Sydney around the same time where a group of artists had been invited to do a live painting installation in the Museum of Contemporary Art uh, as part of a sort of festival there. Uh, and what they did for that installation was to actually pre-paint a, a massive sort of, you know, 20 metre long mural and their live installation on the night uh, was to unveil that piece and then turn up in uh, high vis uh, uniform of graffiti removal contractors with grey paint and to cover up the piece. Uh, and the live performance, in other words, was a performance of graffiti removal uh, that um, was sort of mimicking uh, what they found happening to their work frequently on the streets. Um, through uh, the actions of the council. So um, let me then just uh, wrap this all up with a couple of very brief uh, concluding thoughts. Um, I've kind of, I guess, tried hopefully in this paper to add a little bit of a, a you know, extra, <laughs> at least empirical uh, research into the idea and the discussion of informality from above and elite informality. Uh, and hopefully have demonstrated through this particular case study that that's not something restricted to developers and planners uh, uh, in colluding in uh, you know, elite urban developments in contexts like India and Brazil, but it's also happening in places like Sydney uh, and here in this case in the governance of graffiti. And I've tried to argue that in this particular case, there's a particular kind of order that underpins and directs a range of informal actions, uh, drawing on Gertner's idea of kind of rule by aesthetics. Uh, and hopefully, I think I've drawn attention to a kind of informality that is often unspoken, but which sits at the very heart of graffiti governance in Sydney. Uh, and I do think that that helps us to better understand the way that state power is constituted and exercised in the city. Uh, and it certainly helps us to see a whole new angle on the way that graffiti is regulated. Uh, I myself have tended to look at the laws, tended to look at um, the, the formal interventions, but you know, uh, clearly we can see here a whole range of informal interventions that are going on. Um, and those informal interventions are done in conjunction with the production of a kind of common sense that certain forms of graffiti are bad, uh, what Rudy Giuliani in New York famously called visible signs of a city out of control, uh, but that other forms of graffiti and street art are good. Um, so I kind of, I guess, want to leave you with this thought from Ananya Roy, which I think holds nicely here as well, um, which, you know, opens up a question about what we do uh, about all of this research, uh, if it's right. Um, and she sort of argued in her paper that as planning is not an antidote to informality, neither is insurgence an antidote to the exclusionary city, particularly not to the types of exclusion that are deepened and maintained through the informalized practices of the state. So um, I'm going to stop sharing there and shut up and hopefully leave a little bit of time for questions. So thank you for listening. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kurt. That was, that was really fantastic. And um, we have lots of questions that have come through. So I'm going to jump right to the questions. We've got uh, just over 10 minutes, so we'll see what we can cover. Um, but let me go first to a question from Kim Dubby. Uh, and I'll read it out to you, Kurt. Um, if we make a distinction between street art and graffiti, is this an elite distinction? Ah, so much debated, and I'll be provocative and say absolutely, um, that I guess there's a sense in which graffiti um, styles proliferated, particularly around the late 1990s and early 2000s, um, and some styles came to be referred to as street art to distinguish them from the graffiti forms that were focused on the letter form, especially. Uh, but as I say, uh, in my view anyway, there's a sense in which um, Lots of graffiti before there was ever something called street art also involved kind of iconography as well as um, text and attention to the letter form. And I do think that um, there is a sense in which um, both authorities but also artists themselves have embraced the nomenclature of street art to be able to basically create room for themselves in this aesthetic order that I'm talking about uh, and distinguish themselves from the you know messy old graffiti that's around now. Again, I'll finish by also saying what's fascinating about that is that there are individuals who will move across those boundaries. They'll have an identity in the world that is their street art identity that they can use to get commissions from local council while also uh, cross subsidizing their graffiti work. Uh, so often individuals are moving between those things, which makes that question even more complicated. Never a simple uh, question uh, yeah. from Kim. Um, 
the next question from um, Paloma uh, Bag Bag Bagado, excuse me. Um, hi, Kurt. Uh, I'm really inspired as a graffiti writer how these forms of art are linked with urbanism and the co production of city aesthetics at a pedestrian scale. I wonder how these forms of tags and graffiti may produce different outcomes through practices that go beyond the artist and property owner versus the authority, but rather artists through participatory artworks, strengthening the community force as a bottom-up resistance. Yeah, so um, I'll try and be, uh, give a short answer to that question, which I find really interesting. So I wrote a piece a couple of years ago for an editor collection um, about graffiti and the democratic city trying to say that I don't think all graffiti does that, um, but I think there are a whole bunch of very interesting instances of informal appropriations where I guess another kind of authority is recognized, which is the authority of the people. Um, and so Espo is one artist that I think has been a great practitioner of that, who often goes into neighborhoods and is funded to do so as a kind of globally recognized artist, but kind of refuses to do work until um, he's, engaged local folks in a series of workshops where he actually talks to them about what's going on in their neighborhood and tries to you know incorporate their thoughts and their perspectives on their neighborhood and what needs to change in their neighborhood into the work um, so i think you know that is one example among many of a kind of practice that you know i guess disrupts i think what's going on with both the authorities and what's going on sometimes with the lone um, street artist who's just doing their own thing regardless of context uh, into a kind of interesting collective engagement with place and with politics. Thanks, Kurt. I've got a, another question here. It's a, it's a lengthy one, so I'm going to have to read it out from Ryan Devlin. Um, oh. Hi, Ryan. Well, I wish we were in the same room anyway. <laughs> uh, well, he's going to be presenting next week, so hopefully we'll have a bit of a dialogue um, um, happening at that point. And of course, he thanks you for your presentation. And his question is, you likely know about the court decision that came down in 2018 regarding five points in New York City, which awarded damages to graffiti artists whose work was destroyed when a developer demolished an abandoned factory covered in artwork in Queens. I plead ignorance on law and art in Australia, but I'm wondering if this has sparked any attempts by artists in Australia to go the way of the courts to protect their art and how might formalized rights for visual artists, if they were ever able to be enshrined in Australia, affect the landscapes of informal management? Question mark. Yeah, so that is super interesting. And as you say, the five point case, um, I, I know bits about it without um, being an expert on it, but it is, it is really very interesting precisely for that precedent. Um, so it hasn't happened through the courts yet here in Australia in the same way. But what has happened is that some pieces have now started to get um, <laughs> incorporated into heritage orders in certain neighbourhoods where they've become such a part of the urban fabric that there are now a few pieces where residents have actually applied to have heritage orders slapped on particular pieces. So there's one famous one, for instance, in Newtown, not far from the University of Sydney, that is a mural depicting the moment of the Mexico 1968 Olympics of the two African-American athletes doing the black power salute, important to people in Australia because the third athlete on the day was an Australian athlete uh, who's also, you know, uh, suffered all sorts of consequences for the support that he gave those two athletes in their black power salute. Now, um, that mural now has actually a heritage conservation order, which means that anybody who sells or buys that property technically can't mess with the mural. So that has started to happen, um, but as I say, more through the heritage angle here than through um, any other angles. But um, as you say, like, it's interesting to me that simultaneously what that does is recognize the place of that work in its neighborhood, but from a graffiti writer's perspective, it conserves the work without conserving the practice in this weird way that it kind of locks up the wall and prevents anybody else from doing uh, murals that might cap it eventually and takes that decision about whether to leave a piece in place or to replace it out of a kind of subcultural authority and into a legal authority that is like super interesting. We have another question um, from Durley. Thanks, Durley, for your question. Um, hi, Kurt. Thanks for your presentation. I guess I'm interested in what you think about the fleeting and temporal quality and the dynamic nature of graffiti street art. Isn't it that graffiti artists 
paint with the shared understanding with other artists that their art will never stay for long, as they are ever changing when another artist comes along and paints over their artwork. So how does this common and shared understanding frame your conceptualization of graffiti governance? Yeah, again, super interesting question. And to try and answer it quickly, because I, <laughs> I could talk for hours on all these things. What is really interesting, as you say, is that this, and it sort of goes to my answer to the last question, that there are a set of dying, like kind of rules about graffiti writers and artists policing themselves, right? That there are certain rules that you're supposed to learn through a kind of subcultural education about when it's okay to cap a work or when doing so is a kind of hostile act and an aggressive one against the artist whose work that you've capped. Um, and, you know, to be very crude about it, you know, don't cap it unless you can burn it. Like, and, but even beyond that, it's kind of like, for instance, if an artist that did a work has died, um, it's very uncool to then go over that artist's work. It's been preserved for a reason, etc. So you've got that dynamic going on that sets aside some works and says, don't ever touch them, leave them in place where others are fair game. But then you've also got the authorities coming along with their rollers and their gray rollers and their brown rollers and um, removing things. And what's really interesting about that is that frequently, even though graffiti writers will complain about that and talk about the buff and how terrible it is, secretly, it's like, thank God, because now the wall's unlocked again and I can go back there and I'm not going to be like getting myself into a violent fight with somebody because I've capped their work because the city went and did it for me. Uh, and gee, that was sad, but I guess it got preserved on the internet and now the wall's free for me again. So um, again, that dynamic is much more complex than just a simple writers versus authorities uh, in terms of the temporal nature of the, the work. We've got two last questions, Kurt. Um, the next one from Manis Murti. Um, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Do you think the neoliberalization of governance has further complicated the recognition of informality and in some instances legitimized new ways of informality from above, as in the case of private contractors um, making decisions about the removal of graffiti on behalf of the council? In other words, has the increasing privatization of the public realm and infrastructure management further complicated urban production in direct contravention with the rhetoric of efficiency and transparency in neoliberal governance? Ah, oh, such good questions. Um, so yeah, this is a huge industry. I keep wishing that somebody needs to write the definitive paper on like the graffiti removal industrial complex because um, it is big. Um, maybe it should be me one of these days. But anyway, um, as you say, there's looked at through that lens there's absolutely a sense in which um this can be the responsibility can sort of be contracted out here uh, and you know there's this the decisions that are made are kind of one step removed from the city uh because it's contractors that are making decisions frequently um so that's certainly one thing that is going on um and i guess the thing that i didn't get to talk about here that is also going on uh, that i also think speaks very much to the sort of neoliberalization that you're talking about is the way that um, other agents in the city other private contractors are also coming in and offering kind of you know to reduce council costs on removal by uh, installing graffiti proof materials and maintaining graffiti proof materials in the city so the classic case of that in australian cities and many others is the advertising companies who now uh, are given contracts to provide bus stops and newsstands and benches and street lights and everything else in cities in return for being able to stick advertisements on them. Uh, and again, a lot of that work, you know, is literally the reason that authorities will put up with some advertising is because the advertising companies will come to them and say, I can provide this really cheaply and efficiently to you. So you're not maintaining the bus stops. I'll get rid of all the graffiti for you. All you have to do is let me make some money by sticking ads all over the city. And so authorities are looking at that and going, well, hang on, okay, just advertising, is it worse than graffiti, is it not? Um, and, you know, juggling that, but certainly that's another form of privatization that interacts, I think, with the story that I've tried to tell today. And the last question from Red and Reccio, um, our postdoc at the Infor uh, what, um, uh, Research Hub. Um, hi, Kurt. Have there been forms of resistance from graffiti artists against the government's buffing interventions? And do you think co-production has a place in graffiti governance? Uh, so look, the, the intervention that I spoke on really, really briefly um, 
So you can um, Google the video. Uh, the event was called Scratching the Surface in 2010. And um, that was one example that I, I talked about way too quickly of, you know, somebody sort of <laughs> resisting the, the buffing by kind of mimicking it, but taking the buffing out of place, right? Uh, so <laughs> effectively, you know, taking the buffing from the street into the gallery in a way that graffiti takes the art from the gallery into the street. Uh, you know, there was a kind of reverse process going on there that I think was, you know, it's one of my all time favorite interventions by um, some Sydney graffiti writers. And um, like, I'm not so sure about whether you call this resistance. Um, there's certainly call and response going on uh, where, you know, graffiti writers will carry around a map in their head of where the rapid removal spots are. Uh, and sometimes just make the calculation that I can beat the buff because I've, I'm prepared to climb higher on the wall than they are uh, or whatever um, and say that the exposure that I'll get in this spot, even if it's only for 24 hours, makes it worth it. Uh, whereas in other cases, they're you know, constantly just mapping the spots that are left out. And again, by these contractors that are frequently you know, getting paid to cover all manner of streets in a certain amount of time, but actually the people that are doing the work are being paid piece rates and are not going down certain streets because they don't have time and they're not being paid enough. And so you'll sort of find at, at the very least that uh, lots of artists will have a really good familiarity with the spots that are being left aside uh, or the spots that are hard to reach for the removal contractors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but What's also interesting is the extent to which guerrilla advertisers are in that space and are much better resourced to fight that fight with the removal agents because they are paid to be back there day after day after day. Like I can only tell you that having had the experience, for instance, of working alongside a uh, Wendy, a fellow street artist, like screen printing a bunch of posters, which is like super labor intensive and putting them on the street and then going back the next morning to try and get a photo and it being gone. It's like just heartbreaking and like, uh, there was, you know, the energy and the commitment that it takes to say, well, fuck that, I'm getting back out there tonight and putting the same poster up again and again, is really hard for a lone street artist in a way that for advertisers, you know, they're almost sort of paid to do it. So um, that's a long winded answer to a question. Sorry about that, but there we are. Kurt, thank you so much uh, for your presentation and your time today. You gave us so much to consider and think about in terms of the complex space around um, informal governance of graffiti um, and the role of the state um, and how that state and how state power is constituted in a particular context of Sydney. Unfortunately, we had too many questions than what time could allow us um, to answer and engage with. So I want to thank everyone for, for participating today and for your questions. And I'm, and I'm very sorry to those who posed incredibly interesting questions, but we didn't get to them today. Um, Kurt, again, thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I just have um, one quick note about um, the next seminar we have coming up. And I, I noticed that a number of our participants and speakers are, are, are here with us today. So. I'm going to remind you that next week, um, October 14th, uh, we have uh, a panel discussion entitled Rethinking Urban, um, in Urban Informality, excuse me, chaired by Kim Dovey. And the following week after that, October 21st, we have our second uh, keynote, um, Alison Bart Brown from Cardiff University, uh, who will be delivering her keynote on the informal economy in urban crisis recovery, hugely timely. So it'll be a very interesting discussion. And so come and join us. Um, and if you'd like to know more about INFER, the Informal Urbanism Research Hub, our website is infer.org and you can have a look at um, our, our various different research projects that we have going at the moment. So Kurt, thank you again for your time and thank you everyone out there uh, for your participation today. Yeah, thanks again for having me. Thanks for coming everybody. Much appreciated.